let's get started. So again, welcome to Agile Learning Design, a practical perspective hosted by Bottom Line Performance. I'm Tina Cruz. I'm the National Account Executive here at Bottom Line Performance, working with many of the companies just like yours. And today we're going to talk about Agile Learning Design. Bottom Line Performance is a custom learning solutions company that we uh, started in 1995. And we're really offering innovative uh, learning solutions, e-learning, blended learning, uh, along those lines. We specialize in needs analysis and project management, as well as Agile design. This is part of our Lessons on Learning webinar series. Today, of course, we're at the Agile Learning Design webinar. Uh, next, we'll be hosting our Sales Enablement and Game-Based Learning webinar to, to happen June 22nd, and you can see some of the other upcoming webinars for later this year. We will be sending out a recording after today's webinar, as well as invitations to those future webinars. So watch your inboxes for those. And we hope you all can join us. I want to introduce you today to Jennifer Bertram. She's your presenter today, and she's our Director of Instructional Design here at Bottom Line Performance. Um, as a Director of uh, Instructional Design, she's responsible for researching and implementing new instructional design approaches within DLP, including the Agile development. Um, she also provides coaching support to the Agile services team, and she's got really significant experience in instructional design, project management, and other business solutions. She's really the heart behind all the instructional design that goes into all of our innovative learning solutions here at BLP. We're really glad to have her. I'll let you take it over from here, Jennifer. Thanks, Tina, and thanks everybody for um, being here today. I'm really excited to share with you um, our experience um, in thinking about how we can um, do our work and do it in a way that really helps meet the needs of our clients um, and the folks that we work with. And so that's really what um, I'm going to share with you today. But I want to start out by telling you a story. And um, many of us who are on the phone here today are are instructional designers and we know how to do it right we know how to do it right and so we're going to start out with our analysis and looking at the data and making sure we have all the information to design the right learning solution we're going to talk to our stakeholders. We're going to talk to the learners and the end users who are going to be using this learning solution and make sure that we've gotten all of their input and information that we need. Um, I'm going to write really good Bloom's taxonomy learning objectives. I'm going to uh, make sure I know what my goal is for my materials. And then I'm going to choose the right methods to complete the learning or training, whether that be e-learning or instructor-led. And so we know what the, what the right things are to do to um, make our learning solutions really great. And um, the challenge is that we all have to live in reality. And our reality is this, that we find out in the middle, oh, we have to include this piece of content. Or, I'm so sorry, but the procedure changed midway. Um, or, I'm a new stakeholder, and I want to put uh, my my mark on this thing, and so here are all of my changes. Or, the marketing department changed the branding. And we get this, we get these kind of bombs that come into our lives, and we think, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to start over. And the impact of these requests or changes has become even greater as the kinds of solutions that we're developing have gotten more complex. And so really what I did um, and what we did at BLP is think, okay, how can we work in a different way to allow us to be able to deal with these kinds of changes or requests in a way that um, make everybody happy and allow us to be responsive but still make sure that we're keeping that end goal in mind and still make sure that we're creating the right things. So really the thing that I try to remember all of the time is that I want to work to the value of a learning solution rather than a plan because the statement of work or the work plan or the project plan or whatever it is that you might be creating in your world 
when that's created on the first day of the project, that's also the day I know the least of things about the project. Every day that I'm working on something or creating a learning solution, I'm uncovering new information and I'm getting more details that are going to help me make good decisions about the training, about what I'm creating. And so what I know is that that plan that was created on day one is usually fiction, whether that be exactly what we're going to create, whether that be what the timeline is, and so stop stepping away from that and not trying to make sure that we're following that forever um, was really freeing for us. And as I talk through this, I'm going to kind of share with you how we do that. And what I will say, go ahead and begin by saying is that that doesn't mean that there's no planning. That doesn't mean that there are no commitments. But what it does mean is that we have to plan for change and plan for flexibility. And that's really what drove me kind of into exploring what Agile could do for us and what that might look like for us here at Bottom Line Performance. And um, today I'm going to kind of share some of what we've learned and what we've tried and hopefully that will um, be something that resonates with you and that you can potentially try out um, in your organization. So as we've implemented Agile methodologies and um, mindsets over the past couple of years, there have really been some key benefits that we've uncovered. And so um, I want to share those with you. One of them is that, and for me, really one of the most important ones as the Director of Instructional Design, is that it helps us create more creative, learner-focused courses. And it does that because it allows us to, us to identify as we're in the middle of development, or scripting, or working in storyline, or whatever that thing might be, to say, this interaction would be way better if we did this. Or what if we tried this? And we don't feel so tied to, oh, well, but that wasn't in the original plan, so we can't do it. And it really gives us that flexibility and that freedom to be creative, which is great. The second benefit that it's really given us is to view our stakeholders as partners rather than someone that we are, uh, that's our combatant. Looking at our stakeholders as someone who's involved in the process, who has input, who can see what we're creating and all the way along, and really that they're part of the group that is creating the solution. And that's also um, a really great viewpoint for us to have of our clients, and I think for our clients to feel um, when they're working with us that we're not just going off and they can never see what we're doing. Um, the third thing is, like I've talked mentioned a minute ago, is that it gives us a way to plan for and respond to changes that if a change does come, even towards the end of a project, we have a mechanism that allows us to manage to that and offer choices and options to the people that we're working with. And finally, it allows us to uncover requirements, preferences, changes much, much earlier in the design and development process than it potentially um, used to in, in our old using our old older methodology, and that's been really really helpful in that because our clients and stakeholders are seeing things so early and so frequently, we have a really good feel for um, what their expectations are going to be for each of the deliverables that we're presenting. One of my big agile mantras here at BLP is no surprises. Um, I, I want everyone to kind of know what's coming, whether that be internally as we're doing reviews and working together as teams or with our clients that if we've done a great job of communicating, no one's surprised um, as to what they're getting or what kind of feedback that we're going to get from the people who are, who are reviewing, reviewing the materials that we're, we're developing. It also really breeds resilience. So um, feel free to kind of share in the chat window what drives you crazy about your stakeholders and reviewers and subject matter experts. I'd love um, to see some of the things that you guys um, would say. Um, and I, I would guess that many of ours are similar, kind of what I mentioned earlier, um, changing their minds, not having all of the information, not sharing clearly what their expectations are. And for me, what Agile has really allowed us to do is read resilience so that a change or question doesn't cause panic on the team because the change is coming often um, early enough that we've not done so much that we can't respond to it. 
we want to be able to respond to change and for us to do that we have to share things really early so that we know it's coming. Um, and it's not about just rolling over and accepting any request that comes or that we have to do every comment that's made, but it's more about helping both us and our clients that, um, that work, that we work with about making good choices, about really helping us look at trade-offs and identifying what's important important to them um, to right. other things and that can be a really um, productive conversation. So an example of that, we were I was working with a project manager here and we were developing a video for a client and it was really early in the process. We'd had a design workshop, but then when we came back we started having lots of questions about well what is that video and what's that going to look like and I'm not sure if we really need a video or if we need an e-learning course, and those are all very different things, right? And one of we were talking about it, and we were saying, well, what the next thing in our work plan is that we're just going to script the 20-minute video. And what the project manager and I really talked about is that is way too risky, given that questions from them of is this even the right deliverable. So we made the decision of we're going to do a second clip of the video to make sure that what we think in our heads this video is going to be like is what the client thinks in their heads this video is going to be like. And that was really, really impactful in that situation for them to say, yes, you're on the right track. Here's a couple of tweaks. Here's questions we have. Because then that helps us have much more certainty as we started the video scripting process that we weren't going to end up doing a bunch of work that would ultimately get um, redlined to death or thrown out because we were working under two different assumptions of even a core of a question of what is the deliverable. And we're sometimes in those situations and really thinking about what's the minimum viable pro thing or product or learning solution that I can show that client that's going to help us all make sure that we're on the same page and that we're, none of us are making bad assumptions about what's actually being created. So the rest of my time to with you um, today is really going to be broken into these four sections. So I want to spend just a few minutes talking about what Agile really is. Um, I think that it has a lot of forms and flavors and so just kind of provide a, a small um, foundation for how I view Agile and what that looks like for us. Um, to talk about Agile and instructional design and can that really work and is that really going against Addy, which I will just preview for you, I don't think it is. Um, looking at what it looks like in practice, I'm going to show you a project that I did and how we moved progression of deliverables to help get feedback from the client and then give you a few tips to help you get started. So that'll be the framework for the rest of our time together. Agile has its own set of jargon and language just like us in instructional design and learning solutions do. So I have learned over the years some new words like scrum and backlog and sprints um, and portfolios and all of those kinds of things that you may or may not be really familiar with. And it's not important that you learn right away what all of these terms are. But Agile is really a philosophy that has a lot of different approaches, a lot of different frameworks that you can choose to use. I'm going to share with you a couple of them. But it's really about these foundational Agile principles and something that's called the Agile Manifesto. So you can Google that and find that very easily online as far as what the Agile manifesto is and really it comes out of the software world so many of the challenges that we face in the instructional design world came first to those who work in software development and there was a time when several of those developers got together and said there just has to be a better way. There has to be a way for us to not develop this entire software package and then uncover significant bugs or then get feedback from the people who are actually paying for it that they want different features. And so what can that look like? And there are four kind of guiding principles around Agile that are really what it's all about. And so if you're somebody who's saying, I just need a procedure, I need a step-by-step -step guide of how to quote-unquote do Agile, 
You can find those, but what I would say is that these mindsets are really what's most important, and they're going to look slightly different for each of you and each of your organizations and how you implement them, and that to me is really the beauty of it, and that it can you can make it work in any environment um, in many cases. So the thing that I will say is the items that are bolded, the way the manifesto is worded is that we value both items. We, val we value individuals and interactions as well as processes and tools. Processes and tools are not bad things. It's merely that we value individuals and interactions more. I'm going to focus more on individuals and interactions over a process. So what that means is I'm going to choose to talk to someone and have an actual conversation rather than just saying I'm just going to crank away for days. Anytime someone says, well, I've been working on this for two or three days and haven't really talked to anybody, that's an immediate red flag to me because they've probably not been getting feedback or ideas from other people nearly as much as, as, as they should. Um, the second one here is working product over comprehensive documentation. And products could be lots of things. It could be software. It could be an app. It could be a game. It could be an e-learning course. It could be a facilitator guide for an instructor-led training. And really what that's saying is let's spend less time documenting our ideas and writing words that des describe what it's going to be and instead show people what it's going to be and let them react to it and that that's so much more value than having everything documented to the nth degree. The third principle is customer collaboration over contract negotiation and really what that's about is I, what I mentioned earlier of making choices and identifying potential trade-offs that will be needed to make sure that we're meeting our um, stakeholders' ultimate goal. And finally, responding to change or following a plan. It is a false idea that the plan will never change. I would love to meet the person who's worked on a project where the plan has never changed. <laughs> Something always changes, and instead of being surprised, shocked, angry by that change, being prepared for it, ready for it, is really, really helpful and helps everybody have a calmer, um, happier view of the work that they're doing. And so these are the, there are some additional concepts that go along with each of these principles that you can check out, and I encourage you to do that as a homework assignment here, but these are really what guide the choices that we make um, and really um, help us understand what we're trying to do and we're making decisions about how we're choosing to work on the solutions that we create. Big picture, it's an Agile is a set of umbrella terms for development approaches that are iterative, incremental and collaborative. So if you can remember to be iterative, incremental, and collaborative, you are halfway there. So what that looks like for me is, we looks look first at iterative and incremental, is to not separate out the design and development phase so much, but to be continuously doing those things as we're working. So if we look here at our friend uh, Mona Lisa and imagine if you had gotten each of these panes, um, if you were the person who was buying this painting, you would be able to kind of identify, yeah, I like this gal. Or maybe, I don't know if I, is that a smile, is it not? What do I want this to be? Is the background the right color? And you start to see how you would have had input and feedback all the way through. I'm guessing Leonardo would not have appreciated it, but um, you could have given it as he was working on this masterpiece. And so that's what it really looks like, finding ways of what can I show someone that will help them understand what this is going to be, help me get feedback and continue to refine and revise it so that by the time I'm at the final solution, it meets both the needs of the client or stakeholder, and I also feel really good about it as a learning designer that it's going to meet the needs of the learner. 
it's also collaborative, right? It's all about communication. And what I would say is that from my perspective, the throwing it over the fence method has not been working out for us real well. That the whole idea of, well, I did it, I worked on it for several weeks, I'm just going to throw it over, we'll see what happens. I don't see that working very successfully, and I don't think that feels great for both the people who are creating the learning solution as well as those who are going to be using it and impl implementing it in their organization. I think about it like when you have a party at your house. Where does everybody congregate? They congregate in the kitchen, right? They want to be where the action is, and rather than telling everybody to stay out in the living room, I don't want to see you back here, invite them in. Invite your stakeholders, your clients into your kitchen. Help them cook. Give them an apron if you want to. Help them become part of the process to see the ingredients that you're putting in. And ultimately, you're probably going to end up with a dinner that everybody likes even more than if you had kept them, kept them out of there. Um, People want to be in the kitchen anyway. I've not had a client who says, I really dislike seeing what you're doing, or I really dislike updates or knowing the progress that you're making. People like to know. They like to see progress. They like to be able to take sneak peeks at things, and that's really what I'm looking to do in our workflow is where are opportunities that I can show someone something? Where can I share what I'm doing? How can I get feedback? And I'll talk about some ways that, that we can do that. So that's kind of collaborating with your stakeholders or with um, your clients. And then we're also here at Bottom Line really looking about at ways that we can collaborate internally. So we are on um, Agile Teams. We have um, four or five of those that work here, and they are intact. And so there are some things that being on a team-based environment really support when we think about trying to be more agile in the way that we work. So the first thing is that Agile teams are focused and that you they understand you can really only work on one thing at a time. One of the Agile mantras that you'll hear all the time if you get involved in the um, community at all is to stop starting things and start finishing them. So rather than trying to have 10 things that we're trying to deliver and work on, get one thing done, that's going to ultimately be faster. And there is a lot of research that's been done that we'd be happy to share with you um, around the um, back, getting a backlog and getting backed up in your work and how much less efficient you are the more things that you try to accomplish at once. Secondly, Agile teams are intact. Learning how to collaborate is really hard and time consuming. You guys all know this. Uh, just by thinking about how you work with people. The coworker that you've been working with for 10 years, that you're just in a groove with, you know each other's um, work styles, you know what is really makes that person happy, what's really frustrating to them. You can collaborate with them much more easily than someone that you don't know at all and you're trying to figure out their style or how they like to work. So we keep our teams intact so that they can gain those efficiencies from knowing each other really well. Agile teams are responsible. So there's a big idea in, in Agile teams being self-managing and having shared responsibility. So it's not that, oh, this person who's writing an e-learning script, that's their job. If they miss their deadline, that's on them. I guess they better work over, right? There, and there are places that kind of work that way. When we think about collaborating within an Agile environment, we have a shared responsibility as a team. Our team is delivering this script. Sarah might be the one who's doing a lot of the writing, but if she runs into a snag, if she has another project that tries to compete for her attention, if she gets sick, we as a team are going to figure out how to manage that and how to support her. And what that really does is, one, help us make sure that we meet the needs of our clients really well, and two, it helps everyone feel like their teams have their back and support them in what they're doing, which just real honestly makes for a working environment. And finally, Agile teams are always learning. 
for each project, um, we, our goal is to identify what we want to learn from it. We never want to rest on our laurels. We don't want to assume that just because we did this the last time that it's exactly perfect and we can't make it better. And so we create opportunities on our teams to, um, to identify what we learned from a project or from a deliverable, think about what we might want to try the next time, and hold each other accountable to that. So that can really be um, helpful on teams to identify what, where, where they want to learn, what they want to change, what they want to try out as they're working. So collaborating on an Agile team is um, really great, and those are just some ways that we try to do it is by focusing, focusing on those four things. The other piece we want to do is collaborate with our stakeholders. So I've mentioned this before, letting them into the kitchen, letting them really see part of the process. And I encourage you to think about what might that look like in your world. I will tell you just a handful of things that we have tried. I will often send a small deliverable over, and it could be as simple as an image or a graphic or a paragraph of text and say, hey, we're working on this script, we're working on this course, we're thinking about this image or this scenario on this page, what's your opinion? So rather than sending a 40-page script to someone to review, which feels overwhelming, right? They're going to say, oh, I need 10 business days to review that much stuff. I need a ton of calendar time. And then I'm thinking, well, what are we doing while you're doing that, right? But if I say, hey, can you read these four sentences? Most people will do that in, you know, that day and send it right back. And so that's really what I want to do is look for ways that I can make them really small and manageable as much as possible so that I can get feedback as quickly as possible. The other thing I will do is do it live. So oftentimes, and you may have a similar experience, I have a regularly scheduled um, status call or status meeting, especially on larger projects. I will use that time of, hey, let me share my screen. Here's what our, de here's what our developers have been doing. This is where we are on this. What's your opinion? This is the direction we're going just to get informal feedback. I'm not asking for them to go off and do a review. I'm not asking them to run it by a bunch of people. Now, certainly that might be the outcome of that discussion. They might say, let me show that to a few folks, and that's totally great. Um, but I'll use those opportunities where I'm already talking to my stakeholders to gather more information from them, because that's what I'm all about, is gathering information so that we can make good decisions that are ultimately going to please both our stakeholders and the learners. One of the things that is a trigger for me that we need to collaborate with our stakeholders is when we're talking internally and someone says, well, Jen, what do you think the client would like here? Do you think they would like this image? Um, I would guess that they might want this. Anytime I'm trying to guess or speak on the behalf of my stakeholder, if I have the opportunity to just ask them, that's always preferable. There are some of my clients that I know pretty well, and I think I probably can um, take a stab at what they will like pretty well and pretty accurately, but they often surprise me, right? And just like you're surprised by your stakeholders, and they might say, yeah, that's great, or they might not like something that I thought they would love. And so rather than me trying to speak for them as much as I can, I want to say, okay, well, let's ask them. Is there a way that we can find the information out from them of what their preference would be? And while that sounds really uh, common sense, and of course you do, then I, I what I would say is though it doesn't always naturally come to us that we want to say, well, I want it to be perfect, I want it to be really polished, I don't want any I want it to be exactly what I think it should be before I show it to someone. And if I wait until then, I am often missing out on those opportunities to to get that really, really good feedback. 
the next thing I want to do is just talk you through a couple of ways to actually manage the work. So all that I've been saying here just sounds uh, fairly philosophical and uh, really great if, it, you know, if all the stars align, and it is. Um, but there are some ways that really help us do that, to help us stay focused, to help us um, look for ways to, to do that. And within the Agile world, there are lots of ways that you can manage your work. There are two primary ones that I'm going to share with you today. One is called Scrum and one is called Kanban. And I just want you to kind of understand a little bit of how those methodologies work because they can help you potentially think about how you might manage some of your work. So in the Scrum methodology, you basically are going to set a time period that you are going to plan your work for. Oftentimes, it will be two weeks. It's a very common uh, sprint, um, a, a, a set of time. It could be a week. It could be four weeks. It could be a day. It really doesn't matter. You want to do something that uh, allows you to actually not feel like you're constantly planning and replanning your work. And so what it looks like is on day one of the sprint, you have a long list of things, and you say, these are all of the things that we're going to get done in this two-week period. We've agreed to them, the stakeholders have agreed to them, and by the end of these two weeks, we're going to have these things done. And we've identified how many things we can get done based on what our capacity as a team is. So who's on vacation, how many, who's part-time, who's full-time, how many people we have. You identify and estimate how much work you think there is and how long it's going to take you to do each of those things. And you say, this is how much we get done. So in the middle of that sprint or two-week period, you're pulling work and you're starting and finishing each of those little items. So if each of those yellow cards is a work item, you've started some, you've finished some, and some are still waiting to be started. But the goal is by the end of the day, last day of the sprint, so the end of that two-week period, all of those things are done. And then you start all over again and plan another two weeks and you keep on just doing and you set how much we're going to get done over this given time period. Scrum works really well if you can protect the sprint. And what I mean by that is if you can say, Mr. Stakeholder, you came in the middle of our two weeks, we're on day six, you decided this is a new thing that you want done, that's great. We love it. We're going to add it to our list of things to do, but we are not picking it up until our next sprint. We're protecting our sprint. We at the beginning agreed that this is what we're getting done. We're not changing that. We're not changing direction in the middle of those two weeks. This is very, very common and, and it might even be used in your organizations in the software or IT departments because they often can protect their sprints. And so they'll do a planning and then they'll decide what's going to get done. And then they're constantly just deciding what are the highest priority items that are going to get done in the next set of, um, in the next time box, that next two week period. So Scrum works really well for that and that's what it looks like. Um, Kanban is a different kind of methodology in that it's a poll methodology. We are going to say on any given day, here's the maximum amount of things that we can have um, work in progress. So you'll have a whip limit, work in progress. And that whip limit says, okay, we can as a team, we can have seven things, let's say, on our plates at any given time. And when one of those things get done, we're going to pull in a new one. And we're going to continue just to pull in. It's a pull methodology so that we ideally don't ever have more than seven things on our plate. And our goal is to move things and get them done, started and finished as quickly as possible so that we can pull the next thing in. Kanban has worked well for us at Bottom Line because it, um, on the services side, because I can't always protect my sprints. I can't always say, oh, Mr. Client, that's a great idea, but we will get to you in two weeks. That doesn't usually feel great to them, and I don't want, I want that. I want my clients to feel really pleased with the service they get from us. And so what we use is that whole idea of Kanban. Of it allows me to reprioritize whenever I need to. So if I say, oh, I have seven things this eight thing came in and it's higher priority, then I'm going to pull something off or pause it while I pull this thing in until it's done and then I might pull that back in. 
So Kanban has given me the flexibility here at Bottom Line that we need um, while still allowing us to think about what's a reasonable a number of things that we can have going at any given time and focusing on trying to move those from start to finish as quickly as possible. Then there's something called Scrum Bond. So I told you there was a whole new set of jargon that you're going to learn. And that's really what we do here at Bottom Line is that we use the three core meetings and communication tools of the Scrum methodology with the flexibility of Kanban. So we do planning. We say, okay, what are we going to get done? Like, what's going to get done over this period? Let's at least have some sort of plan. We do a meeting that's called a stand-up. So um, typically in Scrum, you do a daily stand-up. It's supposed to be 15 minutes or so, and it's really an accountability meeting in many ways of what did you do, what are you doing today, and what's in your way. So rather than saying, I, what are you working on? I want to hear what got finished, what are you doing today, and what, if anything, are, is preventing you from doing that. And then using retrospectives to, to um, learn from our projects and to really identify areas that we want to get better and how we want to potentially improve on the team. So we use those meetings along with the flexibility of Kanban, which allows us to reprioritize as we need to, which can be, which can be really helpful. Okay. So I am going to work pretty quickly through this to make sure we get, um, our, get through our time today. And so does Agile work in instructional design? My answer is yes. And so what I would say is that we used to build, if you imagine you wanted a teapot, you both have in our heads what a teapot looks like. You might want a different color or you might want something else, but we both know essentially a teapot's going to have a handle and a spout and a lid and we know what that thing is. And we used to just be building instructor-led training. We used to just be doing that. And now we're building things like this. And if you wanted this thing, there is no way that you could describe that to me in words in a way that I would actually be able to build your exact specifications. And really the point I'm making here is that we're doing more complex things. We're building games, we're building mobile apps, we're building more complex online solutions. And the Addy model really does not help us um, get to where we, um, where we really want to be as far as making sure that we're managing the, the work that we want to. So Addy is, is the image on the bottom here, analysis, design, development, implement, evaluate. There's nothing wrong with that, and I am doing all of those steps. The image here at the top is SAM, which is Michael Allen's um, successive approximation method. And basically what he's saying is you're going to design, develop, and evaluate all the way through. You're going to be doing that kind of continuously and rather saying, oh, you signed off on the design, it's done. What it does is it allows you to say, let's keep looking at the design, let's keep refining as we're developing, let's evaluate as we go to make sure that we're making good decisions, and we're going to continue to do that as we're creating our deliverables. So if you're interested in learning more, um, Michael Allen has a bunch of books on Sam. Uh, he, they're all really great and have been helpful to me. Megan Torrance um, has a model and some writing around her llama method, and that's L-L-A-M-A, -A, just like the animal. And her work, her writing and her discussions are really about how you manage the work. So I would say that Michael Allen is really focused on what your deliverables might look like and how to manage communication. And she's a little more focused on how you're doing the work and how you're and how you're kind of kind of getting to that. Okay. So before I keep talking too much longer, I wanted to give you an opportunity um, to answer any questions that might have come up as I've been chatting. So, Tina, are there any questions that um, I can answer for the group? Yeah, absolutely. There are a couple of really great ones that we flagged. Um, um, let me go back to them. The first one was um, the difference between Agile and SAM. And I think mm -hmm. that you've covered that. Um, another good one here is 
using your examples, what do you do when the client wants a particular product, um, maybe like a video, but the content or topic really screams out for a different format, maybe mm -hmm. learning course, recommendations, yeah. thoughts? <laughs> Sure. So that to me is not, um, it can certainly, the Agile process can help you potentially do some proof of concept ideas. So when we're talking about methodologies, I think there can be lots of considerations that can go into that. But one of the things that I would really encourage them to do is to do some audience analysis or even think about, okay, let's create an audience persona who is this person who's going to need to learn this thing? And for them, what is the best way for them to learn it, given their work environment, given their workflow, um, their preferences, kind of where they're, what they're used to learning things on? Because oftentimes in those kinds of situations, I find it's that we aren't necessarily hearing or thinking directly about the learner. It's more that we're getting stakeholder opinion. So that's where I would start is to think about let's do, let's create a persona of our audience and what we think would be most impactful for them. And then if they were open to it, I would consider doing a proof of concept and really allowing each other to kind of compare and contrast what is the video, what are the benefits of this versus an e-learning let's say for example it's we want them to change behavior well e-learning is probably going to give them more opportunities to practice the behavior that will change than a video might okay Maybe one, one more, more how, one? yeah yeah absolutely how does this model work in forecasting a longer project most stakeholders want an implementation date yeah so what I would say is that you can certainly forecast it and what I would encourage you to do is to pr provide them with a probability of hitting the date, right? So you could, a stakeholder could say, I need this done in six months. And you might say in your head, you're thinking, I know that that's crazy. This is going to take nine months at least. So basically what you would do, and there is some, there is some, uh, there's some analysis that you can do to kind of feel this out, is you would say, okay, Mr. Stakeholder, I am 90% sure if we set this date out nine months from now that we're going to meet that date. We're going to have the deliverable. I am 10% sure that we can meet the six-month date. And I am, you know, 75% sure we can meet here. And so what it does is to tell that stakeholder, there's only, I mean, we can, we can only do so much. Everyone's got the same amount of days. And to provide them with a likelihood that you're going to hit that date can be really helpful for them to understand what risk that they're potentially taking on if we say we have to get it done in that six month period. If I'm going to cut three months from something, what do I know my risks are? My quality is going to suffer. The um, functionality and bugs that are going to potentially have is going to suffer. And I can't guarantee that I'm going to have the right thing. And so it kind of goes back to having having that trade-off decision with your stakeholders and really talking about to them about is timeline really the most important thing. But thinking and even thinking about your own work and a likelihood of getting it done within a time range can be really helpful to think about what's where is reality here and where it would be a really relaxed time frame and where would be something that would really be stressful and we know would be risky. Okay. So great questions guys. Um please keep them coming. And I'm going to go ahead and move along to what it looks like in practice. So I have a really quick uh, example that I want to walk you through of how we can do this. So this is a picture of me. I'm doing a design workshop. So we start all of our um, learning solutions with what is our goal, what is that going to look like. And so this is for an individual course. And I have some learning objectives that I have jotted on the left-hand side there. And then we are doing some drawing. We are literally thinking about what is this e-learning course? What are the interactions going to be? And so what I have here on the screen is that we knew we wanted to do a little animation at the beginning that had kind of tunnel vision and then we were going to do a rewind idea at the end and so we are kind of mapping out what might that look like. So I'm with my stakeholders, I'm with my clients, this is just as much their idea as it is mine and we are kind of mapping out for the entire course what that's going to be. 
Then I'm going to create a course outline and prototype. So this goes back to that first, uh, that first Agile uh, principle slide that I showed you where it talked about um, not spending a ton of time on comprehensive documentation but working products. So what I'm going to do for a single course is provide a very short two-page uh, outline of this is what we said at the design meeting. I'm not going back and making up new things that the client hasn't seen. I'm doing exactly what I had, we had talked about at the design meeting. So there are no surprises here. And along with that, I'm creating some prototypes that are really very focused on the functionality. So this was a little quiz kind of uh, interaction that we knew we wanted to do. This was created to help them to move from our drawing to what would it look like on screen. Things that you will notice here is that there are no content here. I am not worried about identifying or scripting out content. You also notice that there are no images. When there are images, we focus on the graphics, and that's not what I want focused on right now. I want to say if the learner clicks these buttons, if the learner does this kind of interaction, are we going to meet the objectives that we've identified that we want that we want for this for this learning solution? And so, both of these things are created in like less than two days. I'll often, often have a webinar where we'll walk the client through it. They have some time to absorb it, but we are moving on and saying, okay, let's start building out what this thing's going to be. So where we might have done a lot of, spent a lot of calendar time writing a design and doing a lot of things, instead of that, I'm saying, let's get building. Let's start working out what this thing really looks like so that you don't have to imagine what it's going to be. And that really takes us to our next phase, which is a design proof. Um, so a design proof is a fully functional course. It is something that allows the client to see every screen that's going to be there, but not every word is written. So you can see here, this text is not written like the learner is going to see it. It's just describing what's going to be on the screen. I can see that there's a description of the course objectives, but it's not written how it's going to be. I can see that there's going to be an interactive infographic here, but it's not there. It's more about helping them see, okay, all of the buttons are there that they're going to use, but they're not all written. Now, what we did do is anything that we've prototyped, we've gone ahead and built one version of that out. And so what that allows us to do is say, okay, you saw the prototype with no content in it. You said, yeah, I think that would meet our learning objective. Great. But now we're going to start confirming that and saying, let's, what if we put content into one? And so you'll see here that that same kind of decision matrix is here. But now I have some rollovers and I can make a choice. So my coworker is standing on a chair. What do I do? So I can stop and study it or I can just sigh of relief. What do I do next? I'm not sure. Do you report it? And so I see, I get my feedback when I roll over. And so we said, okay, let's look at this one. What's your feedback? What does that look like? And so the whole course is here. This is, we're saying, okay, these are all of the planned screens that we have. This is taking it from, we went from the right board to a very short table to the, and we're already into, this is what this course is going to look like. So these clients didn't have to, try to guess what our plan was. They knew exactly what the screens were. They knew what the learner was going to do, and they could provide us with that feedback. That takes us then to what we call alpha, or you might call the first draft of a course. And what this is, is everything's there. We've written all the all of the everything functions the way that we want it to. It's written for the learner. And what you will notice is that the same interaction changed. So we did really some usability feedback at the, out at the design proof stage where they said, well, like the rollovers were kind of hard to read. Valid feedback. We don't we want the we want the thing to move so it can be larger. We don't want it to have to fit all on one screen. So you can see here that the same content is very similar, but we've changed it quite a bit. Now, previously, if this was the very first time that they had seen what we created, 
we don't know what kind of feedback we would have gotten, and we certainly wouldn't have been able to be as responsive as we were. But by the time we got here, we were really confident that this was right. By the time we're at first draft, I know that this interaction is right because it's really the fourth time that that client has seen it. They saw it on a right board, they saw it in a prototype, they saw it in the design proof, and now they're seeing seen it at alpha and so that's what's really really powerful is that I'm the whole no surprises I'm confident at this point that this is right because we're at our fourth round and we're still only at the first draft of the course and everybody's going to feel good about it and so that's really where that the kind of looking for opportunities to share information with the client can be can be really powerful That's a really short summary of what it looks like in practice, and we'd, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about that. But before I wrap up, I wanted to share a handful of things that you can do to um, kind of get started. So as I've mentioned before, focus on the mindset, not the process. Look for opportunities to collaborate. Look for opportunities for face-to-face -face conversation. Look for opportunities to give team members more ownership and let them run the ball. Where can we be more flexible, less resistant to change? Those are the things that are really going to ultimately create the impact in your organization and really have nothing to do about how you manage the work and a whole lot more about how I view my role and how I view my role with my stakeholders. The second thing here is to have a goal, and this is in many ways a, a very large cultural change and takes time longer than you think it's going to, and you really need to be able to answer these questions as you would with any cultural change to make Agile work. So knowing why you're changing, knowing what success looks like, identifying if you have the environment and culture to support that. Um, making sure that your structure and culture are in alignment and making sure that your management and leadership support it. So if you can't kind of answer those questions, then you can certainly look for more opportunities to collaborate and um, iterate with your stakeholders, but you may not have be able to make a larger scale kind of change. And finally, start small. So you can do things like, let's try having a stand-up and see what that, what that feels like, to have more of an, a view of the work that we're doing. Let's try doing some retrospectives with a specific focus that help us be learners and help us to really identify where we might want to change. I have two websites on the slide here that are great resources that I encourage you to use. And finally, if possible, to create those intact project teams that will allow you to have the time um, to really learn each other and learn how to work efficiently and well with each other. So that's the end of my um, kind of presentation. Tina, I think we have a couple of minutes for questions if there are any out there. Yeah, absolutely. It looks like we have a couple of trends. Um, so a lot of people want to know what type of rapid prototyping tools we use. Um, and uh, if you could get that answered. And then there's a few others. Absolutely. So for the, proto the functional prototypes that don't have words, that don't have anything in them, use whatever you're fastest at, okay? So um, I've used PowerPoint. I have used um, things like uh, InDesign. We have used Storyline or Lectora. Whoever's doing it, you want to do it in whatever you're fastest at because you want to not have any, you want to be able to throw it away if you have to. You're so early in the process, the stakeholder might say, no, that's not what I want them to do. Cool. So in that example that I showed you, the, um, pro the rapid prototypes were actually done in Storyline because that's what the person who did them was fastest then. The course was developed in Lectora, which was the client requirement, but we did this prototypes and storyline just because we didn't have, we didn't know if they were going to work or not. And so we just wanted to get something up there for them to react to what was still fresh in our minds. So great question. 
Right. And um, another question, sometimes uh, it, virtually, when you're meeting virtually with folks, sometimes the process has to take place over distance and a physical whiteboard won't always work. So how do we yeah. sometimes address distance issues when we're doing designs or when we're getting feedback from our clients? Yeah. So I have found that like the right board tools and go to meeting or WebEx are not super friendly for me. You may have different experiences. I'm just not as fast as them and it feels awkward when I'm on a virtual design meeting with somebody. Um I often will um use um PowerPoint and create some blank slides and shapes. And I'll use those as my starting point and use basically right board on a PowerPoint slide as we're having the discussion virtually. Okay, great. Um, a lot of you know how we do this uh, working in the office and I've answered some questions about how we handle face-to-face uh, -face time internally as well as uh, working remotely. Maybe you can address that real quick. Yeah, so I, I certainly think that ideally you guys are, the more physically proximate we are to each other, the more likely we are to collaborate and there's been some research around that, but we do work virtually and we can make it work. One thing I will say is that you have to be comfortable um, using video conferencing. So if you're someone who's working at home in your pajamas and doesn't want anybody to see you, that's not great because we even just seeing someone's face gives us so much more clues when we're collaborating, right? So we really try to encourage using our video conferencing tools and instant messaging to help kind of keep that ongoing day-to-day -day collaboration. Great. A lot of people asked um, before we, uh, before you continued on last time, what the name of the authors were that you shared. So maybe if you can answer that, um, we can answer more questions if folks want to stick around, but maybe revisit some of the resources that you had mentioned. Yeah, so um, Michael Allen, um, A-L-L-A-N, um, he has a methodology called SAM, S-A-M, that's called the Successive Approximation Method, and you can Google that. He has many books out there, um, ATD, he does uh, workshops if you really want to dig into it. The other one is Megan Torrance. Um, T-O-R-R-A-N-C-E, and she has written around the LAMA method, L-L-A-M-A, -L and she also has books and classes through ATD and eLearning Guild. Okay, great. Um, maybe a couple more, maybe before we go ahead and um, break for the sure. day. I think we hit on this, but a lot of people want we want to know what you particularly um, created that flow chart, the interactive flow chart for the course that you shared. I believe that was done in Articulate Storyline. Is that right, Jen? So, like I mentioned, the prototype, the one without any words or images, was done in Storyline. The actual um, course was done using Lectora, um, and we often um, those choices are driven by our clients, um, and that was the case in that in that example. Okay, great. So we're going to wrap up for the afternoon. If people have time to stick around, if you've got more questions, we're happy to stick on the line, stay on the line for you, and and get as many questions answered as we possibly can. We will be sending out the slides uh, for the recording um, post to this webinar once we've got that, and as well as an invitation to our next webinar in the series. And if you're interested, if you felt that this information was valuable to you and you would like a private offering for your organization, please let us know. Reach out to me at Tina at Bottom Line Performance. We'll share my email on the screen here in just a moment. Our next webinar coming up is the Sales Enablement and Beyond, presented by Sharon Bowler, President of BLP. And that'll be on Wednesday, June 22nd at 1 p.m. Eastern or 10 a.m. Pacific. We hope you can join us for that. Here are our contact information. You can reach me, Tina, at BottomLinePerformance.com. You can also reach out to Jennifer at Jennifer at BottomLinePerformance.com. You can give us a ring at 317-861-7326. We've got quite a few resources on our website. If you haven't visited anytime recently, um, we would love you to stop by and check out our resources. Thank you again, everybody, for joining us today. We really have uh, appreciated you taking the time out of your busy days 
to uh, join our webinar. Thanks so much.